Good afternoon. Good morning. Welcome to this third session of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS Society focus on uh, chronic graft versus host disease. My name is uh, Stephen Pavlatic. So the topic today is a uh, sclerotic uh, chronic graft versus host disease. And I would like to acknowledge uh, contributions of the organizers uh, the, and the uh, presenters uh, that uh, joined us today to guide us through this uh, session. The goal of the GVHD Interactive Provider Network uh, is uh, to connect GVHD specialists with community providers to share expertise, discuss cases, and improve patient care. And this is based on the extension for community healthcare outcomes ECHO model, uh, which uses proven adult learning techniques and interactive video technology to connect community providers with a specialist in uh, collaborative uh, real-time sessions. So these sessions are uh, designed around case-based learning and mentorship and uh, to provide primary, primary care and community-based practitioners uh, to gain the practical expertise required to care for uh, chronic GVHD patients uh, and uh, questions and comments from the learners will be encouraged to facilitate discussion throughout this session and future sessions. Target audience, uh, is, this is a um, continuing education activity intended for physicians uh, and uh, other uh, uh, related clinical spe specialties. After completing this uh, course, uh, the objectives should be to recognize signs and symptoms of sclerotic GVHD, discuss systemic treatment options, and describe therapies for a specific uh, um, sclerotic uh, manifestations. So these are the agenda for today. Uh, we have, uh, following this uh, uh, introduction, we have uh, Dr. Annie Im um, uh, to provide a didactic presentation, uh, Dr. Edward Cowan, uh, expert commentary, uh, Dr. Yazan Migdadi, um, case presentation and uh, Q&A session that uh, please everything should be really is meant to be interactive and uh, conversational. These are faculty disclosures, Dr. Pavletic, Dr. Im, Dr. Cowan, and Dr. Migdadi. This program, uh, besides the Aplastic Anemia MDS Society, has uh, collaborative uh, partner organizations. It's a Meredith Counted Foundation and the PB the Match program. For educational and quality improvement purposes, this will be recorded. So uh, by participating here, you are at the same time consenting to be recorded. Any questions, please share through this email address that you can see on the screen. Some helpful tips for participating in this program. So keep please your camera on during the program, uh, particularly if you are uh, discussing, uh, please mute your microphone if not speaking. Uh, to ask questions, so raise your hand on camera or uh, to the uh, reaction section on the bottom of your screen, speak clearly and state your name and institution or practice before stating your question or comment. And you may also use a chat function to submit comments or questions. And here I will stop and I will hand the podium and a, a continuation of this uh, to Dr. Annie Im of the uh, UPMC in Pittsburgh. Thank you, Steve. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to talk about this topic. Um, and I also appreciate um, Dr. Ed Cowan being here to provide our dermatologic uh, expert commentary. So um, as Dr. Pavletic said, you know, we really wanna encourage this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so we will have time for questions. And certainly as we get to the case presentations, we really would love this to be interactive. So please um, contribute with your comments and questions and difficult questions and um, that's that's what we're here for. Um, so I'm going to first provide just um, a broad, quick overview about sclerotic skin, chronic GVHD, <clears throat> um, and then we'll delve into our cases. Um, so you know, keep in mind that you know sclerotic skin is a difficult area, you know, one that is considered the quote unquote highly morbid forms of chronic GVHD. 
um, this as well as bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, because it is, uh, it can be so impactful, you know, to the quality of life of patients, um, to patients functioning, um, and those also um, can be quite difficult to treat as we'll discuss. Um, so <clears throat> um, I'm gonna, like I said, provide just a, an overview about some of the, the presentation and treatments. So the objectives of this talk is to recognize the signs and symptoms of sclerotic skin disease, and then to discuss systemic treatment options for sclerotic skin disease as well. So in terms of the incidence, you know, keep in mind that sclerotic skin chronic GVHD is characterized by inflammation and progressive fibrosis of the dermis and then the subcutaneous tissues. Um, the mean onset is about one year after transplant and incident re incidence reports do vary, <clears throat> but um, have been reported um, between 13 to 20% overall and can be as high as 50% in patients who have um, already severe chronic GVHD. In terms of the risk factors, there have been some um, studies that have tried to look at this and what's been reported is peripheral blood graft, so peripheral blood stem cells um, and total body irradiation or TBI greater than 450 centigrade. Um, both also, uh, so not surprising as both are also risk factors for chronic GVHD itself. And then there have been some other factors that have been reported like younger age, multiple myelomas and underlying disease and HLA mismatch, which um, all are kind of counterintuitive. Um, but I think importantly, you know, I think the point is here is that other risk factors for chronic GVHD itself have not been found to be risk factors for sclerotic skin disease. So, you know, just keep in mind that likely the risk factors for sclerosis in particular are likely different um, than chronic GVHD overall. There is a decreased risk associated with the use of ATG and cord blood grafts, which um, again, also makes sense. <clears throat> so in terms of clinical manifestations, um, there is a spectrum. So we can see, and you know, and of course we're gonna discuss this more in our cases um, um, and hear a lot more from Dr. Cowan, but we can see a spectrum from localized disease, which is morphia-like, um, so localized areas of sclerosis, um, and then all the way to, you know, disseminated sclerosis or disseminated disease with deep sclerosis, paniculitis, and fasciitis. Um, the skin sclerosis can lead to joint contractures, which is, uh, you know, something that we often see concurrently. Um, skin breakdown and increased risk of infections, neuropathy, nerve compression syndrome, and muscle cramps, myopathy, and vascular insufficiency. So um, this just shows you some of that spectrum of sclerotic skin um, in these pictures. And so A and B um, on the top left and top center are these you know, localized areas of sclerosis, so morphia-like. Um, and then uh, C shows you kind of diffuse involvement uh, of sclerotic skin GVHD um, with diffuse sclerosis. Um, and we, and you know, we do want to make the point that skin sclerosis of chronic GVHD is a different disease than systemic sclerosis, um, the autoimmune disease. And so that, that is an important point to make is there are differences between these two diseases. Um, so, uh, so for C, the diffuse sclerosis that you can see, you know, things like this can cause sometimes, you know, a restriction, for example, in, in um, taking a deep breath and things like that for patients. D shows you subcutaneous and fascial fibrosis. And so you can see that rippling that we can see in, in patients. Um, e shows you an example of joint contracture. So this is the prayer sign that we ask patients to do. And you can see that this patient can't quite flatten all the fingers. And then F shows you a picture, an example of the skin breakdown and, and ulcers and, and open wounds that can occur. <clears throat> So um, in terms of transplant outcomes that are associated with sclerotic skin GVHD, so certainly we see functional impairment. Um, you know, things that have been reported are, you know, in, impacting joint range of motion and grip strength, but we certainly see this with patients in terms of, you know, how they're able to function and do their activities of daily living, um, you know, that are, can be quite limited by sclerotic skin. Certainly, I think the burden of symptoms um, is also something that's been associated with sclerotic skin. So um, distress from change in skin color, increased skin thickness, sores on the skin, itchy skin and joint stiffness that have been reported. And it also has been associated with a longer time to withdrawal of immunosuppression. Um, it has not been associated or found to be associated with survival, non-relapse mortality or relapse, although um, it has been suggested that greater body, sur body surface area may be related to poor survival. 
So moving on to the systemic treatment. So this just shows you the algorithm um, that includes currently FDA approved agents for treatment of chronic GVHD overall. So the systemic treatment of chronic GVHD. Um, and so I'll mention this briefly and how it relates to sclerotic skin. And then I'll also move on to talking about treatments specifically for sclerotic skin GVHD. So certainly first line, um, nothing has been yet proven to be better than steroids alone. Um, second line, our FDA approved agents are ruxolitinib and abrutinib. And third line, we also have velumosidil. Um, when we get to fourth line treatment, and oftentimes we are talking about fourth line treatment in this disease, um, then we want to look at clinical trials. And otherwise, there's a, a list of options um, that really is at that point clinician choice. Um, so talking first about the FDA approved agents. So ruxolitinib, um, this is a JAK2 inhibitor. Uh, it is approved for second line or steroid refractory, treatment of steroid refractory chronic GBHD. The overall response rate for all patients at six months is about 50%. So in the large phase three randomized control trial, there are 72% of the patients at baseline had skin involvement with a score, um, an IH score of two or greater in 60% of those patients. And the skin response rate was 41%. Um, but in the article itself doesn't get into details about skin sclerosis and the sclerotic response. Um, but of note, it is, it, I wanted to point out there is an ongoing clinical trial of ruxolitinib in sclerotic skin um, that is ongoing at several institutions. For belumosidil, which is um, a ROC2 inhibitor, <clears throat> also FDA approved for um, third line and beyond. Um, in, this, um, in this study, they had a high baseline skin involvement, again, uh, as skin is very common, so 83% skin involvement at baseline, with a 37% overall response rate in the skin, 16% CRs, again, in the skin. And they did report specifically on sclerosis <clears throat> of the 41 patients with a skin response, 24 of those patients had a decrease in sclerosis. So certainly a, a promising signal there. Um, in terms of the FDA approved agents, I'm not going to um, discuss abrutinib in detail. Um, the study that um, got, led to the FDA approval of abrutinib um, did include patients who had inflammatory or erythematous skin disease, but um, not, there wasn't a specific report on skin sclerosis um, specifically, so I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on that. Um, and I think we do tend to think about ruxolitinib and belumosidil more so for um, um, skin sclerosis. <clears throat> so moving on to treatments that are specific to sclerotic skin, um, there have been some therapies that have been studied um, specifically in this area. And so one of those is imatinib, um, and that is uh, based on its inhibition of PDGF receptor. And so this was a study that was done at the NIH. There were 20 patients, 14 of whom were available for response, who had steroid refractory or dependent sclerotic skin GVHD, and they were treated with imatinib 100 um, up to a 400 milligrams daily. And five of those patients had more than 25% improvement in their range of motion, um, which was the primary endpoint. And seven of the patients had stable disease. In addition to that, eight patients were able to reduce their immunosuppression. And several patients also showed, you know, anecdotal or sort of, you know, subjective responses with visible change in skin texture, anecdotally reported skin softening and improved flexibility. And again, this is something that we see sometimes with anecdotal responses, um, you know, not necessarily being captured in um, the specific um, study responses. Um, another study that looked at imatinib or rituximab, again, specifically in um, sclerotic skin GVHD. So this was a crossover study where patients were randomized to either imatinib or rituximab, which is a CD20 monoclonal antibody. Um, and then they were able to cross over to the other therapy if they did not have an adequate response <clears throat> by a certain time point. So 72 patients were treated in this study, 60 of whom were available for response. Um, and then for, the, for patients who were treated with imatinib, the overall response rate was 26%. And for rituximab, it was 27%. So similar response rates. Um, and then you can see that there was also some success in crossover patients. Um, and you know, likely crossover patients are uh, even more difficult uh, group to treat. So um, again, some signal of efficacy in these you know, very refractory and kind of difficult to treat sclerotic skin GBHD patients. And then um, I certainly um, should mention extracorporeal photophoresis or ECP. Um, this is also another therapy that we often think about or turn to for um, sclerotic skin chronic GVHD. And this is just, you know, very briefly summarizing three studies, two of which were retrospective. So the first one looked at um, specifically uh, reported a response rate of 67% 
um, in patients who had sclerotic skin GVHD. This was a retrospective analysis. Um, another small retrospective analysis showed 80% um, complete responses in cutaneous chronic GVHD, some of those of, you know, of some of those who, who had sclerotic skin. Um, and you know, there also was report of contractors being partially resolved. So again, signal of, of efficacy there. Uh, and then there was um, a randomized trial of ECP that um, didn't meet its primary endpoint, which was total a reduction in total skin score um, in NIH response, but um, it was associated with an investigator assessed response. So again, kind of these clinical or subjective responses, and then um, also a reduction in steroid dose. This was in the randomized trial. So again, something that we think about um, for sclerotic skin. Uh, notably, I think it's, it's important to, to remember that you know, this treatment, as well as you know, many other treatments for sclerotic skin GVHD do take time to work. Uh, and then the last one that I wanna mention is pomalidomide. Um, this was a study, uh, so pomalidomide is an, uh, a second generation immunomodulatory drug, second generation to, to um, uh, Revlimid, or I guess also thalidomide. <clears throat> and this was a study done at the NIH um, of 34 patients, 24 of whom are valuable for a response, treated with pomalidomide at either a low dose or a, a higher dose, so 0.5 milligrams or two milligrams. So 32 of those patients had skin sclerosis, 26 of them who had more than 20% of their BSA involved with deep sclerosis. So in the study overall, there was an overall response rate of 67%. Um, and you can see um, in uh, the figure in the middle, these were the patients specifically with deep sclerosis. You can see that the percent change in BSA towards the left being improvement, towards the right being worsening. So certainly seeing some signal of response here with pomalidomide in these patients with deep sclerosis. And the um, pictures on the right demonstrate an example of one of the patients who had an improvement in their skin GVHD um, in the hyper, hyperpigmentation and sclerosis one year um, after uh, treatment. And then um, two other things that I'll mention that um, you know in studies that are ongoing, so yet to see results, but um, you know we're looking forward to seeing those. One is the ruxolitinib study that I mentioned. So um, ruxolitinib in steroid refractory, uh, sorry, in sclerotic skin, um, refractory sclerotic skin GVHD, going on multiple institutions. And then one with um, glasigib, which is a hedgehog inhibitor, um, also ongoing at several institutions. And then finally, um, I would be remiss if I did not mention axitilumab, which is an exciting uh, drug that is uh, being studied for chronic GVHD, not yet approved, although I imagine will be someday. Um, this is an anti-CSF1 receptor monoclonal antibody. So it targets macrophages, uh, which we think uh, is, is, is involved in the uh, pathophysi pathophysiology of the, of the fibrotic process in chronic GVHD. <clears throat> and so this, um, there was a phase one, two trial and the results were reported at ASH this past year. So overall, there was an overall response rate of 68% in advanced refractory chronic GVHD. 28 of the, of the patients had baseline skin involvement, 25 of whom had severe skin sclerosis, and four of those patients had improved sclerosis with treatment, 16%. So again, um, promising. We think that this is you know, likely in, involved in, um, in, in treating um, fibrotic chronic GVHD. So uh, looking forward to seeing results of the um, now ongoing phase two study. And finally, you know, it is important to mention ancillary therapy and supportive care. I think this is important in any uh, realm of chronic GVHD that we're talking about for treatment. Uh, while we're talking about systemic treatments, we're also always thinking about what can we do in terms of ancillary therapy, supportive care, and kind of organ-directed care. So um, things like deep muscle or fascial massage, as well as stretching exercises, especially really rigorous stretching exercises, can be really helpful for sclerotic skin GVHD. So definitely something that um, should be, things that should be added on um, to your systemic treatments. So I also um, want to end with kind of future directions of where we're going in the study of sclerotic skin GVHD. So, um, you know, I did talk about some of the treatments that we have that are approved that show really promising signs in sclerotic skin GVHD, but there certainly, you know, is a lot of room to go. You know, in the areas that are being focused on that are summarized or discussed, I should say, in um, one of the NIH Chronic GVHD Consensus Conference um, papers from 2021, um, one of the working groups worked specifically on highly morbid forms of chronic GVHD. So I mentioned systemic sclerosis or um, so uh, sclerotic skin GVHD and um, bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome <clears throat> being two of the areas that we consider the highly morbid forms. 
So the discussion um, talks about you know, trying to gain a better understanding of the underlying biology. So what is the exact pathophysiology that underlines this, this transition that goes from inflammation to then leading to dysregulated tissue remodeling and sclerosis, fibrosis. Um, in addition, I think another and really important area is response. So how do we come up with sensitive response measures to first of all, determine the extent of disease and second of all, how to measure improvement and response in sclerosis. Um, you know, this is one of those tough areas where our current um, response measures don't accurately or you know, comprehensively capture the um, clinical responses that we can see in sclerotic skin. So this is gonna be really important for drug development uh, moving forward. And then finally, certainly importantly, is treatments. So, you know, something to consider is exploration of treatments for other that, that are approved or being used for other types of fibrotic diseases. Um, and also kind of innovative ways of um, deliver, <clears throat> excuse me, delivery of topical therapies. So, you know, you know, we don't tend to talk about topical therapies for sclerotic skin GVHD as, you know, they have limited uh, efficacy um, because of the, the deep tissue involvement. And so, you know, are there innovative strategies for delivery of topical therapies, you know, skin directed therapies that can be studied, you know, to then be able to try to effectively deliver non-systemic therapies that would be effective. So I think all really important and exciting areas um, that we're looking forward to studying and researching and hopefully someday being able to, to discuss. And that is um, all I have for my overview. And with that, I am going to hand it over to uh, Dr. McDady, who is gonna uh, take us into our um, case discussions. And again, we really wanna encourage uh, participation and questions, um, comments from the group. Thank you very much, Dr. M. Let me just share my screen. Um, all right, can you see my slides? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Ian, for this very nice overview and uh, introduction. Um, today we have three uh, uh, very good um, uh, clinical vignettes. Uh, they were seen actually at different institutions, reflecting uh, different providers' uh, practices. Uh, if, any if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or submit the questions uh, through the chat. <clears throat> so the first patient actually I see here at Oregon Health, I took over from a, a previous provider in our group and I'm co-managing uh, with a provider in um, Salt Lake at Huntsman um, due to patient like uh, relocation geographically. A 64 year old woman with high risk MDS transformed to AML. Uh, she underwent allogeneic transplant back in October of 2013 uh, with an HLA, HLA mismatch sibling uh, using reduced intensity conditioning with flu male and standard of care GBH prophylaxis uh, with uh, methotrexate and tacro. Um, most relevant for us is the post-transplant um, complication, um, including acute uh, skin and GI GBH, for which she received a prolonged um, um, uh, course of steroids complicated by osteoporosis and multiple fractures. Uh, later on, uh, she developed chronic GVH, primarily affecting her uh, eyes, mouth, and skin, um, for which she received multiple lines of therapy, including steroids, tacro, and uh, serolimus. A uh, patient has been off immune suppression since July uh, of 2019. And here, just to clarify uh, for the skin involvement for the chronic GVH, patient has uh, sclerotic changes primarily in the lower abdomen and back, and seems like that was managed conservatively um, and symptomatically for that time. Uh, earlier this year, uh, the patient presented uh, to an outside hospital, one of the community hospitals with uh, respiratory symptoms and fever, and she was found to have uh, rhinovirus pneumonia. Uh, part of the workup, uh, she had imaging with IV contrast, and the same night, actually, she developed a maculopapular rash, uh, basically generalized involving all her body as presented in this picture, for which she was started on a high dose of uh, steroids with prednisone one mg per keg, um, the biopsy was not consistent with uh, graft versus host disease, so the uh, steroid 
which uh, were tapered uh, quickly. Um, unfortunately, this new rash actually got worse once the patient uh, was taken off steroids. So it was resumed at lower dose of 10 milligram with mild improvement. Uh, the patient continues to come to the clinic with still maculopapular rash in the lower extremities, which is kind of consistent with the this new onset rash in the past, uh, this year. And in addition to the ongoing um, sclerotic changes uh, she had even before in her lower abdomen and back. Um, so her current um, NIH score is severe due to skin involvement as well as ocular um, uh, symptoms. And um, I think here I'll pass it to Dr. Cowan and Dr. M uh, for um, um, uh, to comment on that. But I guess it's it's primarily two points: is uh, approaching uh, diagnostically and therapeutically a new rash, uh, although the patient has already uh, chronic GVH manifestations. But this rash is um, um, new. Um, in uh, morphology as well as uh, presentation. And also since the patient has um, uh, other systems involved, what would be the options in terms of uh, systemic treatment? So I'll pass it on to Dr. Cowan and Dr. M. Thanks, Yazan. So I think uh, um, this is really a, a really nice example of a tough real world case where you have a person who has longstanding GVHD involvement with skin fibrosis, and then you have a superimposed problem that um, then becomes an issue of sorting out if she's flaring skin involvement, or is this all just related to um, what sounds like initially started as potentially an IV contrast reaction. And so um, one, one common scenario that we see is that patients do indeed have a drug reaction or a contrast reaction, and then um, the rash doesn't resolve like you would typically accept, expect with a short-term drug reaction. And so um, the scenario here sounds like perhaps um, a flare of GVHD sort of came after uh, the attempt at steroid tapering. If there's still a red rash at that point, it would certainly be reasonable to do another skin biopsy um, because you know just redness alone isn't considered diagnostic. Even though she has the underlying skin fibrosis, you're trying to determine whether or not there's a new change um, the other thing that you describe is um, sort of ongoing tightness. And if the fibrosis and those changes are a, a new verifiable worsening, then I think um, you've got even more evidence that you're dealing with a flare of probably both an epidermal and uh, dermal sclerotic um, picture here. Thanks, Ed, for that um, comment. So um, I agree. I, you know, it's one of those situations we see clinically where, you know, um, there is something that is not necessarily chronic GVHD that may appear like it clinically, but then that, that exact thing may incite, um, you know, an inflammatory reaction that leads to worsening or progression of chronic GVHD. You know, we see this in the lungs, right, with lung infections um, and progressive BOS. And so, um, I think that's, you know, that's likely, you know, I, I would love to hear if people have had that kind of experience um, before. Um, so, you know, please comment if you have and, and what you've done about it, or please raise your hand or jump in. Um, I think in terms of uh, systemic therapy, you know, uh, while you could um, and, and, and likely would want to, you know, increase the steroids again, I think at this point, uh, would also want to consider um, a steroid sparing agent, um, thinking about next line like uh, Jacafi to be able to then successfully taper steroids. Um, but you know, and I think that's why I think a discussion would be helpful here. I would love to hear of other thoughts. You know, some people might just do steroids, some people might go straight to, to Jacafi, but I would really um, be curious to hear um, people's input. And if um, you don't hear any comments, maybe Dr. Pavletta can comment. Um, or I do see some familiar faces in the in the audience. So, um, you know, Iskra or um, Pashna or Arpita, if any of you guys want to jump in. <laughs> Unfortunately for you, I know you guys, so. Uh, 
Hi there, it's Hi. Rupita Gianni from OHSU, uh, Yasin Migdadi's colleague. Um, this is a great case. Thanks, Yasin, for presenting. And I, I agree with um, everything that has already been said. Um, one thing I wanted to point out was that that RSV infection was probably uh, may have been critical uh, in sort of sparking um, what has been going on. Um, so I think we have to sort of always remember that acute viral infections or any infections kind of sparks um, our flares and makes uh, existing GVHD worse. <clears throat> Next up, um, I apologize if I missed it, um, but uh, uh, I guess a, a repeat PFTs and a CT with expiratory phase would be warranted. Um, and uh, with the history of fractures, I would definitely consider a steroid sparing agent um, along with um, steroids if you were to go that route. Once you have established a flare and um, an indication to change therapy. So I, I personally would go for uh, a high dose of steroids plus steroid sparing agent, um, hopefully at the same time. That's what I would aim for. Love to hear what others think. Thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi. Thank you also for turning your camera on. I appreciate that. <clears throat> and actually that's a, you know, also thank you for having a very thoughtful and comprehensive approach to the patient because we're not just talking or thinking about her skin sclerosis. This is really obviously, you know, the whole patient. So uh, I totally agree with you about the long investigation. <clears throat> Does anyone have a different approach? I, I jumped in a little later, sorry, in the middle of the case. So I've been a, a bit quiet, but um, I, I maybe I missed it. Sorry, was she on photophoresis or um, anything? No, not previously. Okay, so you know that's something I think about. Uh, you know the response rates really are not as robust, but it really does help in the long run, about thirty percent, and then combining with something else. And I would I'd be interested to see what everyone thinks of the newer drugs that are steroid sparing now, and how everyone wants to use them, either uh, together or one after the other. And I I just don't know what. Belumosidal and roxalitinib in combination may have together. Um, and especially because in some of the studies, you know, pulmonary GVHD does seem to have some effect with, with at least belumosidal, maybe. Um, yeah. Some, some thoughts like that. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Munchi. I think that's actually a very thoughtful. And that, you know, I, I really love these discussions because. You know, as you guys can all see, there's no one right answer in chronic GVHD usually, right? There's, there are different approaches based on, you know, I mean, we could have a whole discussion on photophoresis and, you know, the kind of risk benefit profile versus, you know, some of the other drugs that we talked about. Um, so absolutely. And <clears throat> um, you hit on a lot of the drugs that I mentioned in my overview of Pashna. So, um, so that's great. I mean, you know, I think Again, this is the place where we can sort of discuss, you know, what are people using and what are the scenarios where people might be using one versus another, risk benefit, things like that. Other thoughts? I mean, even though she does have fractures and, and all these people do, I think it's really hard to move away from steroids uh, in a setting where there is active progression. And I, I, I know we don't want to use steroids um, as a single agent, but it's going to be ending, it's going to end up being the backbone of at least the starting agent. And then we try and wean away. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. I think um, that is the beauty of some of these other agents is, you know, adding them on, not, nece not necessarily for the initial response, but for steroid sparing, because steroids are going to likely give us, you know, a quick and, and, good response here. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, and I also actually wanted to comment also on your earlier thought about combination, you know, combination therapies. I think that is probably um, one path, uh, you know, in the future that, you know, certainly is being looked into. So maybe <clears throat> someday there will be combinations for first line or combinations for second line, you know, um, things like that that we can look forward to. I mean, a lot of us are doing things sort of anecdotally or, um, but it'll be nice to see studies on that. 
other thoughts? Dr. Pavletic, anything else you want to add? Uh, well, one thing, uh, so it, it is a great case because uh, this patient was uh, three years of uh, systemic immunosuppression. So it, uh, uh, in some way, it really challenges and makes us think like uh, uh, of all these definitions of cure and success in chronic GVG therapy, right? Being three years of immunosuppression in any research trial, those were like big success. And uh, so it's clearly that uh, tolerance, uh, it's, uh, you know, lots of talking about functional tolerance and, you know, it just makes us think, you know, how, how in the future, you know, we can, uh, we can uh, prevent this from happening and be, have some, much more, some kind of clever interventions early on. So that's, I think, uh, certainly some, three years after stopping, uh, yeah, besides all this uh, considerations, how to treat uh, all this uh, good look uh, uh, into any associated factors, uh, you know, as, you know, has to be done. So, yeah, great, okay. great, great, great discussion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, why don't we move on to the next slide? Sure. Well, thank you all for this, uh, for the input. Uh, defi definitely a challenging patient and uh, will provide hopefully a uh, follow up in the um, coming uh, sessions as uh, we're just still discussing like options of treatment for this patient. So that concludes our first patient. The second patient actually um, was seen at uh, uh, Huntsman. A uh, 77 year old woman with history of uh, high risk MDS with TB53 mutation underwent allogeneic transplant in February of 2020 with HLA matched unrelated donor using reduced intensity conditioning with flumel and standard of care GVH prophylaxis with uh, methotrexate and tacro similar to the uh, previous patient. Uh, it seems like the first year after transplant it was uneventful. Uh, the MDS actually, um, there was no evidence or morphological evidence of MDS at the uh, one-year mark and the uh, baseline mutations they were cleared in addition to 100% donor chimerism. Around that time the patient presented uh, with rash um, it was um, the few, basically hyperpigmentation of the trunk and the chest and abdomen and for the extremities, the patient had lichenoplanus changes uh, with, as you can see in this picture, morphia-like lesion uh, around the uh, left elbow. Uh, the total body surface area affected was around 35%. Um, the biopsy was consistent with graft versus host disease. Uh, so patient was enrolled on a clinical trial, the flight uh, study with etacetinib 200 milligrams in addition to ECP. Um, a month later, patient had a flare of the skin uh, GVH, so was uh, so a prednisone 0.5 milligram a mg per kg was added, uh, but the patient was not able to tolerate that due to GI side effects. The etacetinib uh, was decreased due to interaction with antifungal coverage with voriconazole. And uh, the question is what to do next, and here I'll pass it on to Dr. Cowan to talk also about possible skin toxicity with uh, voriconazole. Thanks, Suzanne. So again, a, another case, it's, it's sort of a mixed picture with skin fibrosis. It's being described as morphia, a good amount of body surface area, but also um, these violaceous lesions. And at least from what we see here, it looks like the photo exposed surfaces. And so I think an important teaching point um, for patients who have known GBHD is that they can still have skin issues that aren't necessarily due to GVHD. And so one of the things that you wanna think about uh, for a patient who's on voriconazole is whether or not they could be developing phototoxicity. And I think we have one or two slides uh, on that. If you wanna to go to the next slide, Yazan. And so this is gonna be redness and uh, typically gonna be limited to the head and neck area, you know, the distal extremities, and then often the feet uh, or lower legs. Uh, depending on the patient's exposure. So it requires both UV exposure as well as exposure to the drug, but um, it's actually much more frequent than um, is listed in the product labeling. And in my experience, we see this in about a third of patients who are treated with voriconazole. And I think we have one more slide. And the, the phototoxicity can be quite severe. And so um, blistering may actually develop um, 
with sun exposure, and this, so this could be mistaken for bolus lesions with GVHD, and you can have uh, involvement of the lips, which could be mistaken for oral involvement. I think we have one more picture, and this is an example of one of my GVHD patients, and you can see the mucosal involvement is just on the lower lip because that gets more UV exposure, whereas you wouldn't expect that sort of asymmetry with your typical patient with uh, oral um, GVHD. Thank you, Dr. Cowan. Uh, so back Thank to Thank you so much, Ed. Can I just ask a quest quick question? What do you think, is there um, a, a reliable way to differentiate um, between the two clinically, aside from these kind of little hints like the sun exposure or things like that, or is it just, you know, histologically? Yeah. yeah, when I talk to dermatologists, then the main thing I say is this is where you really need to slow down and get a really careful history, because you should be able to sort this out in terms of you know, in this case, this this kid on top had been in Canada. He was sent back to the GBHD for a flare, and no one had bothered to sort of put two and two together with the, the start of VORI for presumed um, pulmonary uh, prophylaxis. And so if you get a careful history together with the appearance, I think you can usually sort it out. Um, the, the patient that Yazan showed had changes that really looked more like in planus like localized silvery scale. There wasn't a clear demarcation from like her her arm, uh, you know, where she'd wear short sleeves, and so um, there are usually enough clues that I think you can you can figure that out. Great, thank you. All right, um, going back to our patient. So uh, etazetinib was increased to 200 milligrams when the patient was off voriconazole. A month later, patient presented with new onset open ulcers in both lower extremities bilateral shins with one open wound, as you can see in this uh, picture uh, uh, around the ankle, uh, in addition to increased skin tightness in bilateral shins and calves. And uh, I pass it on uh, back to Dr. M and Dr. Cowan for comments, what to do next. Yeah, so particularly on the lower extremities, when you have um, severe fibrosis, skin breakdown is a major problem. And then, then if you have overlying epidermal or lichen planus-like disease, the epidermis itself is gonna be very friable. So when a patient gets to this stage, it's very difficult to manage the wounds, first of all, but obviously their systemic treatment is gonna be a major focus. And so um, I'll defer to Annie to talk a little bit more about um, sort of uh, second and third line options here, but this is the sort of patient that really would benefit from a dedicated wound care center, um, protection of the limbs, making sure she's you know, wearing pants and some sort of covering, particularly if she's engaged in any sort of real physical activities where she could injure the skin. Um, because once these wounds open, they are really a challenge to close. Great, thanks, Ed. And I think you know this whole discussion, I think, again, just reminds us of how important the multidisciplinary approach to chronic GVHD treatment is. So thank you so much, Ed. Um, so, you know, this patient had a little bit of an, um, you know, a unique um, initial line of therapy because of being on the clinical trials that started on itacitinib and ECP. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, things, to, and then um, didn't tolerate um, steroids. So things to think about, you know, I think, um, and again, no right answer. So we would love to hear, again, comments from, from the um, attendees, but, so you could think about um, Velimosidil at this point. Um, you know, he has had technically three lines or two prior lines of therapy, sorry. Um, he, she, actually, I'm sorry, I can't remember they, um, have, you know, I've had two prior lines of therapy. <clears throat> so could think about Velimosidil, um, but you also could think about Ruxolitinib. So, you know, I, I can um, imagine some people's hesitation because this person already has had um, a different type of JAK inhibitor. Um, so, you know, um, while not ruxolitinib, you know, a different JAK inhibitor, but remember that the JAK inhibitors do have different, um, you know, inhibition on the different JAK pathways in, in different amounts. So, you know, it is worth, um, you know, thinking about ruxolitinib, ruxolitinib, although again, you could also do Velumosidil. I think both are very reasonable options. Um, one, you know, we wanted to take um, a moment here to point out that um, there are NCCN guidelines for um, treatment of chronic GVHD, um, and you know, ruxolitinib is um, a category one recommendation for um, next line, you know, after steroids for systemic therapy because it is it does have 
phase three randomized trial data to, you know, to support it. So just wanted um, to remind people of this, this resource as well, but would love to hear from the group in terms of um, people's thoughts about Belimosidil or um, Jacophy or other things. I see um, Catherine Lee has joined us. I see Corey Cutler has joined us. Um, I'm just pointing out names that I know <laughs> and can call on. Escrapusic is still here. So if anybody wants to um, jump in with your expert expertise, we would love to hear it. Sorry. Or I questions or comments. It's the case. I apologize. Oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. This was a case of uh, basically a, a patient who had voriconazole toxicity to the skin. And I think that that, you know, makes the case, I think, really interesting because, you know, I think sometimes we're very kind of focused on chronic GVHD, but obviously there's a huge differential there, but <clears throat> when it comes to these types of rashes, but, um, and then was on inositinib ECP, um, progressed and then was put on steroids, but didn't tolerate it. So um, kind of thinking about next line. I mean, I, I've had some success in cases like this with belumosidil, and I've actually sent two people for hyperbaric oxygen therapy on limbs that looked extraordinarily sclerotic, where there was some issue or some concern about the blood flow. I've actually sent two people to mm. hyperbaric oxygen, but I started belumosidil at the same time and sent them to a wound clinic and did all of the things. So I don't want to say that one thing or the other was the cause of good good outcome. I think that that's a great point, Corey. And one of the advantages of a wound care center is that they can sort of often expedite that process if they think it's an appropriate patient. Hey, Annie. That's great. Thank so, you for bringing that up. Hey, Catherine. Yeah, this is Catherine. Uh, so um, I, I actually know this patient because this was my patient. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, her clinical situation was actually also com confounded. She had quite a bit of lymphedema, which would always kind of contribute to her wound reopening. Um, and so with diuresis as well, this often helped her wound heal a little bit faster until she also was a patient who kind of just managed her own medications um, and would put things on and take a break from things when she felt like it, except her GVHD treatment. So, um, you know, I initially started uh, ruxolitinib on her once I designated her as not responding further to it to system in an ECP. Um, and uh, at that time, Belomacidel had not been FDA approved yet. So we had started ruxolitinib. Uh, and she actually had an initial response, but then we were, we were approaching, uh, it was just not improving any further. And so, um, I recommended adding belamosidil to ruxolitinib, and I uh, dropped the ruxolitinib down to about five milligrams a day and added belamosidil uh, on. And she actually had a really nice response to that combination. Um, <clears throat> again, her, like these wounds kept fluctuating. They were uh, sometimes reopening again and always in the situation when edema was, was um, accumulating. So we had, you know, we had had her being seen by lymphedema. Um, I actually did try uh, sending her to hyperbaric oxygen uh, therapy, but that um, did not work out. Um, had always tried challenging her on steroids and she could just not um, tolerate them. So one of my questions to the group is, in the situation where steroids have not been tolerated, has anyone ever try to change to dexamethasone or try to desensitize a patient to steroids? No. I have not. Have others? That was one thing I was um, about to do <laughs> is to switch her steroids, et cetera. Uh, and then unfortunately she had disease relapse. So, uh, which, which progressed very quickly. And so we just didn't get to that point. Mm, tough case. Tough case, but I think brings up some really interesting points that you guys bring up. I mean, you know, the void toxicity, as we talked about, you know, the hyperbaric oxygen, which hadn't come, come up yet in prior discussions. So that's, that's a good point too. Appropriate wound care, some of those ancillary therapies 
that we that we should think of always think about. <clears throat> um, since we're running a little short on time, why don't we go on to the last case? Okay, sounds good. So I had a little glitch with the slide presentation. Okay, so the uh, third and last patient, and uh, again, thanks uh, for the group at Huntsman for sharing um, the clinical vignette. A uh, 66 year old uh, man with JAK2 negative myelofibrosis who underwent allogeneic transplant in June of 2013 with HLA mismatch unrelated donor using reduced intensity conditioning with Flumel and standard of care GVH uh, prophylaxis with uh, methotrexate and Tacro. Uh, as we will see in the next coming slides, the patient received droxelitinib and that was primarily for myelofibrosis um, um, uh, more than uh, GVH. Early in the post-transplant course, uh, uh, patient has immune hematological complications with ITP, uh, for which uh, he received IVIG with no response. So was given a rituximab and prednisone and seemed like that helped with the ITP. Uh, six months after that, patient presented with uh, pulmonary symptoms um, and the biopsy was consistent with uh, CARB and pos possible lung GVH, for which patient was treated with uh, prednisone. It seemed like the year after was uneventful until around two years after transplant, where patient presented with a um, small area, like around uh, body surface area of 5% with um, macular rash, uh, part of the abdomen and the upper back. Uh, this was managed primarily by uh, topical uh, steroids. Three months later, the patient for different medical purposes received IVIG, after which uh, he developed um, diffuse erythema on the back as well as the anterior chest. Um, uh, in addition to that, dry skin on the face. So the biopsy was consistent with graft versus host disease for which the patient was started on prednisone of 0.5 mg per keg uh, with no response. Uh, so the prednisone was increased to one mg per keg uh, and tacro was added with actually uh, good response and uh, resolution of the erythema. Once the patient was tapered down to prednisone of 0.5 mg per keg, uh, patient started developing uh, scler scleroderma features, uh, primarily around the front and side of the neck. Um, and um, so the steroid was increased back to one mg per keg and tacro was increased. So although this is um, kind of small body surface area affected, sounds like it's affecting the quality of life and potentially uh, movement, especially um, the most of those changes around the neck. So I'll pass it on to Dr. Cowan and Dr. M on uh, next steps of diagnosis and treatment. Thanks, Susan. Susan, can you advance your slide one more? Um, oh, it's not advancing. Maybe um, stop sharing and reshare again. Uh, sure. Can you see it now? There we go. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, from a skin standpoint, I don't have too much to add about this case other than the, the involvement that was described, particularly um, in the head and neck area, even though, as Yazan said, a small body surface area can be a huge source of morbidity, both in terms of physical functioning, um, being able to turn your head to see your side view mirrors and um, you know, discomfort associated with that. Um, but also if there's enough fibrosis, you know, the normal uh, functioning uh, of the swallowing reflex and um, you know the discomfort associated with that feeling of a foreign body um, when you're trying to eat. And so uh, I think from a skin standpoint, the major take home is you know involvement of certain higher risk areas. You certainly want to be a little bit more aggressive with. And then Yazan, why don't we move on to the rest since the the, the case continues to unfold? Why don't we do that completely and then we can open it up. Sure. Uh, so back then, um, the only agent approved uh, for steroid refractory uh, chronic GVH was abrutinib. So patient was started in that in uh, August of 2017. In addition to ECP, developed pericarditis. So it was discontinued uh, for, um, and then I'll just go over like um, the course with the patient. Um, after that, a patient received uh, roxelitinib. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it was primarily for maintenance of myelofibrosis, but actually the skin GVH um, got worse uh, with the uh, erythema on the trunk as well as the scleroderma uh, 
features in the trunk and the lower extremities. Um, so patient eventually uh, start, started last year on um, bilomosodil, uh, but had significant um, side effects, including fatigue and uh, some cognitive um, um, side effects. And so recently was uh, increased to a prednisone of one mg per keg uh, while the patient was being screened for the uh, CSF1 receptor um, um, targeted uh, treatment on the uh, on a clinical trial. And um, so Dr. M, if you want to um, comment on that. Sure, yeah, thank you for this case. Um, and thank you to um, the group who contributed because this is actually a nice example of what we kind of talked about in the overview in terms of the systemic therapies and kind of the, you know, <clears throat> the order of systemic therapies to some extent. Um, also highlighting, you know, that tolerability is always something that we have to think about. Um, I have actually not seen these kinds of toxicities with Valumosidil. Typically we think of it as very well tolerated. So I'm curious to hear if people have had experiences requiring discontinuation as well. Um, but, and, and then, you know, in this patient, I think appropriately then transitioned to a clinical trial. Again, when we, we also talked about axitilumab briefly. So um, I guess, you know, because time is short, let me just open it up to comments or questions about this case or um, like Mosadil or other things. Could you go back to the photograph of his neck? So that looks um, punctate and almost psoriasiform um, to some degree. And in patients like this, I often do, I often treat them like they have psoriasis. So weekly low dose oral methotrexate sometimes is helpful. That's a trick I learned from my dermatology colleagues here. And they've also been exploring the use of the topical psoriasis therapies as well in, in non-sclerodermatous looking lichenification like this. Corey, would you also say there looks like the appearance of some morphia? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to lean in to see this picture closely. It's kind of like shiny. Like yeah, there's some shininess and thinning and Almost some of those are depressed rather than plaque-like. Yeah. Hard to say. Yeah, you bring up a good point, though, in terms of thinking about other, uh, you know, I mean, there's a whole list of other therapies that we can think about for chronic GVHD and, you know, anecdotally. Um, I think that makes sense, you know, I mean, a, psori a psoriatic type form and using low-dose oral methotrexate. Ed, I don't know if you have comments on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, methotrexate is on the list of things to try for GBHD, and it certainly is used for met for morphia and um, scleroderma. Um, this patient has you know, clear fibrosis on the anterior neck. That's what that white area is, and these are probably angiomatous changes. So these are more vascular. Um, so certainly, you can get a psoriasiform phenotype, um, but um, I, I don't have personal experience using like the new topical apremilast, you know, there's the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors that are now approved for topical psoriasis. Uh, what about like topical TAC or something? Was, is that helpful? Uh, TAC, you mean tacrolimus or triamcinolone? Oh, tac tacrolimus, sorry, I know you had yeah. a... Yep. Yeah, so absolutely, I think as an adjunct, um, but I think the, the take home point would be, you know, these sort of patients are going to need systemic therapy. And so you can certainly use a non steroid for sensitive areas at risk of stria, such as the neck area, but um, usually those are not going to be sufficient if there's, you know, definitely fibrosis that's already present. Um, you know, I want, I want to be respectful of time. So, um, any last comments on any of these cases, questions um, to the group? Otherwise, I really want to thank everyone for participating, for listening, for commenting and discussing. I think um, actually everyone brought up some really nice, important uh, take home points. Um, Dr. Pavletic, do you want to? Um, Absolutely. It's been an outstanding session, and I have to show you full slides. Uh, October 19, bronchiolitis obliterans, Dr. Cutler, uh, Williams, um, 
Kelkar, and then in November we have a additional session. So please stay tuned. Um, the uh, some other announcements of other partners. The uh, B, uh, the Plastic Anemia MDS has this uh, webinar uh, that you can access uh, about the role of transplant for treating MDS in older patients. Uh, other webinar that's uh, going to happen in uh, on September 28, uh, BDMEG, increase access uh, to uh, transplants for a sickle cell disease. Our partners have some great uh, seminars coming on. October 21, Fountain uh, Foundation, Biology of Chronic GVHC, Dr. Buxbaum, and January next year, Dr. Pidala, How to Choose Drugs. We heard how hot topic is that always. And then a, a great uh, a symposium and seminar by uh, Meredith Cowden in springtime next year. 